Family Guy has been a great, but also controversial show. Above all adult sitcoms, while it's a unique style, crazy plots, and the characters getting into all sorts of hijinks, and most notably its humor. The humor is what gives the show popularity, especially with its cutaway gags, and the jokes are always on point. And yes, while the humor can get rather dark at times, the writers do in a, in a way that is not meant to be hurtful or offensive. Unfortunately, the show has since been the dust ever since Seth MacFarlane, the show's creator, has left the series. Aside from the providing voice lines and starting to focus more on his other shows and projects, the newer seasons of Family Guy lack any good humor or anything overall amazing. It's just very poor writing without the man himself. It's honestly not too much of a surprise as to why the show has gone downhill with its viewers. But what is a surprise is the fact that the show is still able to be renewed for another two more seasons. I'm also not sure how many of these viewers are wondering if this show will even ever get a movie, as it's been said several times in the past couple of years. In recent news, it's been said of the movie as Seth will be an important part of the film, starting with the script. Well, as someone who is a former associate of Seth, I can tell you this. No, he didn't make a mo the movie, but what he did make was initially of putting an end to the series. To give a bit of backstory, I'm an interviewer who works at a company that I will not say the name for legal reasons, but basically what we do is we associate with any other companies that produce TV shows, movies, short films, you name it. We give out the best ideas for content creators and directors and writers that would have definitely make their films a whole lot better. As well as the interview them and ask them why they became a creator, director, or writer. What kind of ideas they had in the past or what they plan on using in the future, etc. We have tried to merge with Fox, but they heavily denied our request. However, that didn't stop me from interviewing the writers and directors. I have interviewed with a lot of creators as well from the series, and one of them just happened to be Seth MacFarlane. In the chat we had, we were discussing the topic of Family Guy. We joked about how badly the episodes have gotten throughout the series. When I brought out the topic, ever being a big movie for the series, that's when something told me that I would have never suspected. For the past years, Seth has been going through a lot of stress with his other shows and projects he'd been working on and seeing Family Guy was still running to this very day wasn't so pleasing to him. It didn't help seeing American Dad tagging along. He never intended for those shows to be turn run running at the same time. He only made American Dad after the cancellation of Family Guy back in 2002. At first he thought nothing of it, and thought it eventually would the, the shows would end. But it's been years and neither of them would have stopped. He has been planning putting down at least one of the two, at the time, but he couldn't figure out which one. Eventually, he decided it would be best to put down Family Guy, seeing how the show has gotten long enough. He wrote an entire script for this final episode and got the voice actors and animators to help it become a reality. After reviewing the film itself with the people who helped, he decided not to publish it, at least in his words, not yet. So he kept the disc containing the film, and the company also had a copy stored away in archives. After that, he simply left the series, except providing voice lines, and focused on more of his other shows and projects. Seeing interested about this episode, I asked Seth if he could give me more details about it, and he said he would email it to me later in the day. I thanked him for his time and left. When I got home, I opened up my laptop and checked my inbox. Sure enough, there was an email from Seth. At the bottom of the email was an mp4 file. I clicked on download it and download it rather quickly. Now before I get into the episode, I just want to say that I'm only sharing this just because I think you all deserve to know how Family Guy was supposed to end. And despite what Seth said, I'm sure Seth himself wouldn't mind too much, given how much he seems to care very little about the show, if at all. So I can personally assure you Family Guy fans out there, what they're about to read is way better than the Family Guy we see now. The intro started with this episode. The Family Guy theme song played, but an instrumental version while showing the slideshow of Family Guy's many iconic moments throughout the seasons, such as classic 
Hitler get cutaway gag, Peter tripping and hurting his leg, Peter running away from the airplane, and many, many more. Once the slideshow concluded, it faded to the usual Family Guy title card popped up. And this time, I am a red cartoony stamp with the label words, FINAL EPISODE, in all white and all caps. That was it. It was a title cliche as in may sound, as it would then fade out and back into the outside of the Griffin house. With a daytime outside view, it would only then f slowly transition to Lois in the kitchen, scrambling some eggs in a pan, as well as throwing some bread in the toaster to make the toast. With Brian and Stewie already at the table, Brian was typing on his laptop while Stewie was on his sitting on his high chair on his phone. Stewie asked Brian, What are you working on? Brian looked up from his laptop and faced Stewie. Well, I'm glad you asked, Brian began. This is what I believe to be the golden ticket to entering my dream as a writer. Stewie looked at his eyes at Brian. Brian, are you seriously trying to despite all your failed attempts? This would be different. This story I'm writing is completely different from all my past ideas. This will for sure be in the libraries across the country. Stewie then just sighed. I'll start selling tickets front row seats. Your biggest downfall again, he joked. Brian also sighed and went back to typing. Lois scooped the scrambled eggs onto the toast and onto six different plates. Kids, breakfast, she called out. Meg and Chris walked downstairs into the kitchen, dressed in their usual clothes. They both sat down and started to eat their breakfast. A few seconds later, Peter walked into the kitchen. Morning, family. Anything new going on? Meg spoke up. Well, my graduation is coming up in a month, so I was wondering... Meg was then cut off by Peter as he grabbed her head and proceeded to fart on her face as she squealed like usual. Meg simply just groaned before finishing up her breakfast, not bothering to finish her sentence. Chris then glared at Peter while he wasn't looking with a face of disappointment, then showed a face of sorrow towards Meg. But then he also didn't pay attention to Chris. I guess Chris for once actually felt bad for Meg for all the abuse she's had to put up with of her asshole of a father, Peter. Then he walked up to Lois with a smirk on the face. So, Lois, I know it's been a while since we had any alone time. What do you say we fool around after you drop off Stewie at preschool? Lois then aborted a tone. I'm not in the mood today, Peter. Peter then asked, Are you sure? Then twirling her hair around with his finger, Lois replied, Yes, in a rather annoyed tone. Peter just said, Okay, in a disappointing tone, then walked over to the table and ate his breakfast. The scene transitioned to Meg and Chris walking out of their house past their neighborhood and started to make their way to school. After about a second of walking, Chris then spoke, you know, seeing Dad still treating you like garbage really does suck. If you need someone to talk to, you can always talk to me, Meg. Meg then turns around and faced her brother with a face of disgust. Oh, stop acting so innocent. It's not like you're treating me any good, either, she protested. But Meg, I... Before Chris could finish his sentence, Meg then put on her earbuds that were already plugged into her cell phone, likely listening to some music to ignore her brother. Chris just sighed as he and Meg continued walking to the school. They continued walking until there was at least a sound of a woman's voice from behind him yelled out, Hey Meg, think fast! But Meg was still with her earbuds in her ears. Didn't hear that she was met with a glass bottle to the head, shattering in the process, causing it to fall over. Meg then turned around to be greeted with the face of her previous school bully, Connie DeMacco. She, along with her friends who were on either side, laughed manically at her towards the ground. I knew you were a dumbass. You couldn't even see the ball coming. Guess you really need to check your prescriptions to see if they're correct, ugly. Connie exclaimed, still laughing at her friends. Chris then just stood there completely silent. But once again, he gave a face of sorrow. Knowing that Peter wasn't Meg's only problem, he was completely silent for, for a moment before he finally burned out. My sister's not some filthy shank, skank who thinks that works at the strip club all because you got she got expelled from that school from all the times you've gotten in your trouble for all your stupid shenanigans. Which I may need to remind you of your criminal record because you faked your death, pinned the blame on my mother, and getting her arrested. Only for Karma to bite you in the ass so hard that it will lead into your arrest. It's no wonder why you spend the rest of your sad life at that club. Connie then seemed to be taken aback, 
of what Chris had said before regaining his composure and saying, Well, at least I'm not some fat ass who hangs out with his unattractive sister. You two must really make a good combination for the ugliest people on earth. She and her friends laughed again before walking away. Chris then turned around to help Meg up. However, Meg pushed his hands away before spying, Chris, stop acting like you care. Just stop. But Meg, just leave me the hell alone! She then yelled out before putting back her glasses and earbuds. Chris once again sighed as he and Meg continued on to school. Neither of them were saying a word during the rest of the trip. The scene then cuts to the outside of the school before cutting to Chris and Meg walking in the entrance. As they walked in, both of their then went to separate ways to their respective classrooms. Chris was walking down the hallway when he was met from some friends of his. The moment they said hi and then gave Chris a couple of high fives and fist bumps. Meg, on the other hand, was met with several funny faces and scowls from her classmates, as well as a degradatory name such as Ugly Bitch and the world's most disgusting living being. She was met with some spitballs in her face and even a student threw a dodgeball at the back of her head. Once again, knocking her to the ground, causing her glasses to fall, she stood up again and sighed. Finally, she reached her classroom, but of course it wasn't any better for her. As she sat down, she was met with several spitballs, but she did her best just to ignore them. God, why do I have to suffer every day? She said in her head. Then, once again, transitioned the scene to the outside of the Patrick Beer Brewery where Peter worked. Then it cut to Peter sitting in his office, typing away on the computer while drinking a bottle of beer. Preston then walked in to have a chat with Peter. Griffin, I've been noticing some things about your employee status, he began. Peter then looked up from his computer and sat at his boss, as looking a little nervous. Oh, about what? he asked nervously. Well, after going through your reports and the other for stuff you've done throughout the months, I can safely truly say that you are truly the amazing employee at Pockwit. Peter's face immediately went from nervous to a surprise after hearing what Preston had told him. In fact, if you get a huge document done by the end of the week and give a second presentation about the company distributor, you may just be in for another surprise, he finished, before walking out of Peter's office. Peter just sat there with a face still of surprise. Oh boy, I hope I get a raise, or even better, a promotion, he said in his head before going back to type it on his computer. The scene then cuts back to the house with, before cutting to Lois and Brian in the kitchen. Lois was washing dishes while Brian was still sitting at the kitchen table, typing on his laptop. Lois then politely asked Brian if he could help her out with the ch other chores needed to be done. Brian politely declined, saying that he's working on a new book, and saying that this one will definitely make him famous. Lois scoffed and said, You're still on about that book phase? Brian then looked up at Lois and responded with, it's not a phase, Lois. I'm trying to become a good writer to become famous. Lois rolled her eyes at Brian and responded with, How many times do you have to hear it, Brian? You're never going to be a good writer. You always lack any some kind of knowledge as a professional writer. The last couple of books you've written always ended up in disaster. That's why I'm still doing it. Success takes time, Lois. And this time, I have a new idea, Brian replied. That is why you say all the time, but your ideas still end up in the disaster. You never, ever be professional at writing, she protested. Sheesh, why are you being such a jerk? Brian responded offended. I'm not. I'm just telling you the truth, she responded. Now, can you please help me with the dish the rest of the chores? No, Brian replied. What was that? Lois asked. I said no. I'm busy. Now, please let me get back to work, he protested. Lois then sighed and started to wipe down the counters. Good for nothing, dog, she muttered under her breath. The scene then cuts back to the school, but with this time at the cafeteria. Students were chatting with their friends while eating. Some were getting lunch, some were getting hanging around. It then cut to Meg, sitting with her friends, if Sir, Patty, and Ruth. Meg appeared to be spacing out and eating very slow. Her friends then noticed this and asked Meg if everything was all right. Yeah, just the same stuff going on in my life. I know I've been trying to ignore it all, but now I'm just at the point where I think I can't take it anymore. Like one more bad thing happens to me, I may just lose it, she said. All of her friends stared at each other with cringe looks on her face. 
Meg noticed this and asked, Guys, are you okay? There was a silence for about ten seconds. Meg, Evster began, We don't know how to tell you this, but... She then cut off her si sentence and hung her head. We're moving away, Meg, and we're not graduating here, Patty said, finishing Evster's sentence. Meg looked shocked. Well, what? She stuttered. Well, what do you mean you're all moving away? Ruth spoke up. Up. You see, Meg, my father got a new job somewhere else, so me and my parents have to move to a different city so my dad could be closer to his work. Evster is moving away because their parents want to move back to Chicago to be closer to family. And as for Patty, well, I got caught in a guy in a men's room and my parents are very disappointed in me. And as for my punishment, they're moving me to a new school, said Patty, finishing Ruth's sentence. Meg slowly started to tear up and her friends immediately noticed this and walked up to her. They all embraced her for a hug. Meg, you know we love you, right? Esther asked. Yeah, Meg sniffled. And you know we could still call, text, FaceTime us, right? Patty asked. Yeah, it just won't be the same with you guys at school with you around. We were always, like, supposed to graduate together. I feel truly alone, she broke out down. It may feel that way, yes, but... Ruth started. That doesn't mean you're truly alone. We are still your friends, even if we won't be around to see you in person. We surely don't want you to be sad for the rest of your senior life here at Cohogs High School. We want you to be happy that we are here as your only real friends. And now we encourage you to fight all around the pain you're going through right now. Please just remember to do so, Ruth finished. Okay, Meg replied, a small smile spreading across her face. Then she hugged them back. I love you guys, she exclaimed. We love you too, Meg, they all said as one sentence. The hugging continued, but it was short-lived as a fist slammed onto the table. Meg and her friends turned around to see a very tall and buff blonde teenage boy wearing a black leather jacket, grinning at Meg, with two other brunette boys on the side of them, wearing the same jacket, doing the same, all of whom are likely the same grade as Meg and her friends. The teenage boy then began to speak. Well, 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 if it isn't Meg Griffin. Meg Griffin just sat there frozen. My name is Jace, and you might not know me, but I know you. You and your family got my girl Connie expelled from this school. We were supposed to graduate and go to this college together. But you and your family's antics are completely messed us over. Meg still had, uh, sat there frozen for about five seconds before finally standing up and blurting out, That bitch had it coming. Her antics nearly got my mother put in prison for what she did. She deserved every single punishment she's gotten. Jace then smacked Meg across the face, causing her to fall to the ground, shattering glasses on impact. Don't you ever say that about my girl, you piece of shit. As revenge, I'm going to make sure you and your family don't move a single muscle on this planet, he threatened. Leave her alone, Patty protested, along with Esther and Ruth. All of you shut the hell up. This is none of your goddamn business. This is between me and Meg. He responded before pushing them out of the way. It then cuts to Chris at his table with a bunch of his friends. He then turned around likely hearing the commotion when that was transpiring. Chris immediately had a very shocked expression on his face and then cut to Chris's perspective of seeing the bullies in front of Meg who were still lying on the floor. Jace grabbed Meg by the shirt and proceeded to throw a punch after punch in her face before cutting back to Chris now with a horrified expression. Oh my god, Meg! He shouted before running towards to where she was. When he finally reached to her, he yelled out, Stop! Leave her alone! Jace turned around to face Chris and then smiled menacingly at him as well. He let go of Meg's shirt and walked over to him. Chris Griffin, I remember Connie told me about your ex-boyfriend, one of which being a fat blondie like me, and she also said that he was a mem of the Griffins, and I take that beside that's you. You're damn right, that's me. Now, what the hell do you think you're doing with my sister? Chris responded angrily, avenging my girl for what your sister and your family had done to her. That's why I'm doing that's right. Me and Connie are dating. She did say that she was into bad boys, Jace said, smirking. We did nothing to Connie, she brought that all on herself, Chris protested. Liar, Jace yelled. 
Before pushing, punching Chris in the face, knocking him to the ground like Meg, Chris stood up with a bruised body and a bloody nose and then lunged at Jace. The two began the brawl like crazy, throwing after punch after every punch, while the students in the cafeteria pulled out their cell phones and recorded the fight. Kevin's friends then joined in the brawl, but Chris was able to overpower them all, and one of the brunette boys got on top of Chris and began to strangle him with his arms. Chris struggled for a bit before grabbing a nearby fork at one of the tables out and literally quite stabbed the boy's right hand, causing the blood to pour out. The boy cried out in pain before Chris grabbed his right arm and threw him to the ground. The other brunette ta boy tackled Chris to the ground and began several blows throwing to Chris's face. Chris kicked the boy in the groin as he fell, and Chris punched him square in the face, knocking him to the ground along with the other brunette boy. Finally, Kevin tried to throw more punches to Chris, but Chris surprisingly quick and dodged every punch. Chris grabbed Jace's arm and literally twisted it. Jace yelled out in pain. When Chris wrapped his arms around his waist and slammed him into the ground along with his buddies, Chris hyperventilated for a while before saying, Nobody touch my sister! And of course, Chris then sat down to the fact that Meg lended out his right hand before asking her if she was alright. Meg then looked absolutely astonished. Y you, are, you really do care, he said before running up to Chris and grabbing his hand, immediately hugged him. Chris then carefully pushed Meg a little until she was eye to eye with her. Of course I do. You're my sister and I love you. I know I may have never seen those these past couple years, but ever since they you stood up to me, mom and dad at the same time, I even tried to get rid of you in order to remain, remain popular in school. I've regretted those both intakes and over time, and the fact that I myself is a victim of abuse at times. Both your words and your actions have recently been eating me for days, so that's when I realized that you're my sister. More than a lightning rod holding the family together, Meg then hugged him even tighter. Chris was hugging her back. Principal Shepard walked across the cafeteria with a serious look on his face. What is all with the ruckus? He said, then noticed Jason and his friends lying on the ground, completely bruised. His face went from serious to shocked. Oh my god, who the hell is responsible for this? Everyone in the cafeteria pointed to Chris and Meg. Principal Shepard looked at Chris with an angry face. Is this true, Griffins? Did you beat up these students? He asked angrily. It was me, sir, Chris replied, but only because... Chris was then cut off by Principal Shepard. My office, now, he demanded, but I... Now, he barked. Chris reluctantly followed him to the office Meg ran up to Principal Shepard and tried to explain him everything, but he didn't listen and told her to go to get her to the nurse so the three boys, lying on the ground, could be treated for their injuries before walking away with Chris. Damn it, she huffed. She then turned to face everyone who tattled on Chris. You bastards, she said before walking away. The scene then cuts the essay of Principal Shepard's office. The door before cutting to the Principal Shepard, sitting on his desk with Chris, sitting on the chair in front of him. Now give me one good reason why you beat up those free, Principal Shepard demanded. The blonde hair wanted to attack my sister, Chris replied. And why didn't you just confront him? Principal Shepard asked. I did, but he punched me in the face, so I had to defend myself, Chris responded. Well, you should have just ran to me about it, and I could have done something about it. But no, you chose violence, that's something I do not tolerate in this school. I'm calling your parents. Principal Shepard threatened. The scene then panned out to the door of the office with Meg staring down at Chris with a sad expression on her face. It then cuts to Meg outside of the door and Meg turned away from it, sighing heavily. The scene then cuts back to the house. Lois was doing her laundry when she felt her phone vibrate in her pocket. She pulled out the phone and answered it. Hello? She began. Yes, this is she. Chris did what? She shouted at the same tone of the vibe in episode 5, episode 11, after Peter beat up Kyle, to which was likely a reference to that. Okay, thanks for letting me know. I'll be right over. She finished before hanging up. The scene outside once again cuts back to the brewery. This time the sunset was outside the view, before cutting back to Peter's office. Peter was still in his office typing on his computer. After a few seconds of typing, 
He grabbed his computer mouse with a single click and clicked done. Patria then walked into Peter's office, to which Peter says that he's finally done with the documents. Patria congratulated Peter for all of his hard work and told him he could finally go home early if he wanted to. Peter thanked him and packed his bag, walked down to the parking lot, and hoped his car. Peter would then pull out his cell phone and text to Quagmire, Joe and Cleveland, to meet him to, to the clam, to which they all replied with okay. It was just cut to the outside of the clam with Peter arriving at the place, parking his car on the side street. Peter then walked and sat in the usual booth, with Quagmire, Joe, and Cleveland already sitting there, beer mugs in, her, in their hands. Peter then both walked over and greeted them. How was work, Peter? Joe asked. Oh, it was great. In fact, Patriot said that I had been doing such an amazing job at the brewery based on my status. He also told me that if I were to give a good presentation at the new distributors that are coming in tomorrow, I'll be in for a surprise. Joe, Quagmire, and Cleveland congratulated Peter for his hard work, to which he thanked him. You know, since I am feeling in a good mood after the news Patriot gave me you guys, you can order beers whenever you want on the menu. And it's all on me, Peter exclaimed. In fact, Peter stood up from his seat. Hey, beer, everyone, beer's on me! Everyone else at the clam cheered for Peter, and the clam immediately escalated to a full-on drinking party. Jerome and the other employees brought out plates filled with beer and food. Everyone started to chow down and drink nonstop. Peter and his friends were slowly getting drunk by every drink they have taken. You know, this is an all fun but dandy, but you know, what is this party really needs? Joe drunkenly asked. Everyone shook their heads. Some fireworks! Joe exclaimed, pulling out a gun and started shooting out a couple rounds in the air. Everyone continued to cheer. Hey Joe, let me get a couple rounds, Peter said also drunk. Joe then handed the gun and a couple of shout rounds as well. This time, however, he started to shoot at a very random direction of the clam, shooting a couple beer mugs and other dishes that were lying on some tables, including some beer bottles that were on display on some bulbs, and even a window. Then he accidentally shot Quagmire in the right leg, who caused him to shot yell in pain. Ah, damn it, Peter, what the hell? Peter looked absolutely shocked at what he just did. Oh my god, Quagmire, I'm so sorry. Sorry? Sorry! You just shot my leg! I can barely stand it! Quagmire, it was an accident, I swear! Accident? Yeah, that's the second time you shot me by accident! You can never control yourself! Quagmire stopped talking for a bit before saying, I know I've said this before, but maybe I should add a little salt to my words. You are an idiot. No, scratch that. You are one of the world's dumbest individuals to ever crawl walk across this earth. Seriously, all your actions lead to consequences, and yet, you would never learn from any of them. You know I'm surprised Lois is still with some retard like you, who could barely take care of himself or his children. Oh, which also reminds me, the abuse, you are an idiot. I am done with you. And I know I said this before, but this time I mean it. I'm done with you and your bullshit. This friendship is over for real. There was silence for a moment before Joe spoke up. Peter, I think it's best you give me the gun and leave. Yeah, you also caused a lot of damage in my bar, Jerome exclaimed. Peter was quiet for a couple minutes before saying, Fine. Then he handed the gun to bar Joe and walked off the bar, headed back to his car before driving off. Eh, yeah, they're probably jealous of the good news I gave them, he thought. The scene then cuts to the outside of the Griffin house, with Peter pulling up in the driveway. Peter walked out of his car and locked it and went inside the house. Hey guys, I'm home, he shouted before walking into the kitchen, where his family was already at the dining table. Oh good, Peter, you're just in time for dinner, said Lois, grabbing a plate of meatloaf. Lois then looked at Peter, who must have figured out something was a little off about him. Peter, have you been drinking? She asked. Mm, maybe a little, he replied. Lois just sighed and told him just to sit down, to which he did. Lois placed a plate of meatloaf on the table, and Peter was the first one to cut himself a slice. Lois sat down and did the same. So, Peter, how was work? She asked. Good. I may be just getting a raise or a promotion, he f replied. Okay, she said, with a hint of disbelief in her voice. Anyway, Chris, is there something you want to tell your father? She said, looking over at Chris, who seemed a little nervous. N no, he stuttered. Chris, 
Either you tell him, or I will, Lois said. Fine, Chris turned to face Peter. Dad, I got in a fight at school. What? You got in a fight? Peter asked. Yeah, Chris replied. Wow, Peter said. There was once again silence for a moment before Peter asked, Did you win? Yeah, Chris replied. Wow, you really are the man who could defend himself, said Peter. Lois seemed to be taken a bit of a back from what Peter had just said. Peter, please don't encourage him like that. He literally stabbed a boy in the wrist with a fork and dislocated one's arm for God's sake. Yikes, Chris, that's my monster right here. Were the boys messing with you or defending yourself? No, they were just messing with Meg, and I couldn't hold back and I can see them do something like that to her, Chris replied. Well, that's kind of a stupid reason to attack, but okay. Peter! Lois scolded. What? He got suspended for a week because of that, and he is also grounded during that time. Lois, it was our defense. There is no reason to ground him because of that. Lois took a deep breath. Peter, follow me to the living room, please, he said. She said. Fine. Peter replied before Peter finished up his dinner quickly. Then he followed Lois into the living room. Room. They both sat down on the couch and Lois began. Peter, I can't believe you would encourage Chris to do violence. If the boy's messing with him or Meg, or anyone else for that matter, then he has the right to fight back. He's standing up for himself and others. Standing up for himself and others? Peter, that's not how we should be teaching our children. We should be raising them. How to solve conflicts peacefully and respect others. Oh, come on, Lois. It's not a big deal. Boys will be boys, right? No, Peter. That's not an excuse. This behavior could have serious consequences for Chris in the future. We need to be responsible parents and guide them in the right direction. Responsible parents? Lois, you're overreacting. Chris needs to tighten up, like this old man. Peter, this is not about you. Our son's well-being gains education. We need to be united front to uh, support the school's decision to suspend him. Lois paused for a second before speaking, this time in a more serious tone. You know what, Peter? I have this said this several times to you, but you really need to listen to understand. You are a terrible father. You always gave a terrible advice to your children. You rarely ever spend quality time with them. You often make them feel like crap, but most notably and frequently abuse them like it's no big deal. Oh, and you're not only a terrible father, but you're also a terrible husband to me. Peter asked. How? How? When was the last time you got me flowers or even took me out for dinner? You have plenty of time to do so in your own time when you're not at work. I literally asked you if you want to fool around this morning when before after the kids got to school. I Because I very knew you make me very insecure about my aging. Something you do constantly do. Not just by your words, but also by your actions. You often make jokes about my aging and make comments about my self-conscious. And finally, just like the children, you have never spent any quality time with me either. I used to see you as a strong, devoted father, but now I see you as a terrible, fat man-child. If that's how you really sees me as then, then I'm sleeping and eating on the couch. Peter huffed. Fine by me, Lois responded angrily. Peter went back to the kitchen and grabbed his dish, then went back to the living room. Lois, on the other hand, also, so pretty much, much was not, was also went back to the kitchen, started eating while giving Chris another lecture about not listening to their father's advice, why it's not good for them. After about a minute of silence and eating, everyone went upstairs to their respective bedrooms. Peter went down to the basement, grabbed the blue blanket that was neatly folded in a box, before walking back to the living room. He didn't even bother to get his PJs on from his room. He just took off his shoes and unbuttoned his shirt. He then grabbed his TV remote and turned on the TV. While another episode of Star Trek was playing, Peter started to think about what both Quagmire and Lois said to him earlier, their voices echoing in their head. Peter then started to have flashbacks of all the times his abuse, not only towards Meg, but also with Chris. And finally, he had flashbacks of him being a jerk to Lois and even her friends. Peter let out a huge sigh. They're right. I'm a terrible friend, husband, and father, he said. After the episode of Star Trek ended on the breaking news TV, of course, popped up, transitioning to Tom Tucker, sitting on his booth. Good evening, I'm Tom Tucker, he began. Our top story for the lottery enthusiasts, get ready for the big jackpot. The next lottery right now is astonishing about 
150 million billion dollars up for grabs tomorrow in tonight's lottery. It's time to buy your lucky numbers and dream big. Stay tuned for more details of the extraordinary opportunity. Peter immediately shot up about hearing the lottery. He smiled and put his index finger on his thumb and chin and began to think. Before I continue on with the film, I am going to point this out because I know you can all hear you scratching your heads. Yes, Lois herself is also feeling guilty of being a bad wife and mother, but as you read on, you'll see what the film's main plot has in store. Since the scene had faded out once again and back outside of the Griffin house like it was before the intro cutting back to the kitchen, everyone was already at the table eating their breakfast. Peter walked into the kitchen. Morning, family, he said with a yawn. No one said really anything. Meg reached out to grab her glass of orange juice, but she accidentally tipped it over and then was on the floor shattered with the orange juice all over. Damn it, Meg. What the hell is wrong with you? Lois shouted. I'm sorry, it was an accident, Meg replied. Don't talk back to me and clean it up, Lois shot back. Lois, calm down. It was just an accident, Peter said. You have no room to talk, Peter, Lois replied. Peter just grunted and walked over to Meg. Meg, sweetie, it's okay. Here, I'll clean up for you. You just finish your breakfast and go to school, Peter said in a very calm tone. Meg seemed a little confused, but just shrugged and sat back down. Why is my dad being nice all of a sudden? Meg fought in her head. Lois then rolled her eyes and said, What did I tell you, Peter? What did I tell you? Before sitting down and eating her breakfast, Peter just ignored her and started to wipe down the juice, then sweep up the broken glass. Since Chris was suspended from school, Meg was all alone at school. Her friends were also not there, thankful thankfully Jason and his friends were not there either. So Meg was able to get through the school without any form of harassment, aside from the occasional spitballs and bad names. The scene then cuts to the brewery before Peter, who was now wearing a blue and white striped tie, then met in the room, holding a laptop and placing it down with Preston beside him. In front of them were three people in business suits. One of them was a young black haired male with a laptop as well as another young long, long blonde woman with her glasses and a notepad and pen. The last one was an old man, probably in his late 50s, early 60s with a mustache. Peter greeted them and he began to present. So, are you all ready for this amazing presentation you ever witnessed? It's about one or only, but Puckerschwit beer. Peter then began holding a bottle of beer. What makes Puckerschwit beer so special? The young male asked. Well, let me tell you, my friend, said Peter, grabbing a remote control, aiming towards the presentation that was behind him, pressing one of the buttons. Showing a slide of a photo of himself drinking a bucket beer while smiling and cheering. Puckwit beer is like party in your mouth. It's got a balance of all the hops and malt that will make your taste buds dance. Plus, it's brewed right here in Quahog, so you know that local flavor. But what about the competition? The woman said. Competition? Ha! Puckwit beer doesn't need to worry about that, said Peter, showing a unique slide photo. That was Patriot with bottles of Puckerschwit beers in his hand. It's got a unique blend of Swiss of secret ingredients to make it stand out from the crowd. Let's not forget about the iconic Puckerschwit beers. Here's Patriot mascot. He's the life of the party, Peter exclaimed, pointing at Patriot, who smiled and nodded at him. Can you guarantee quality? The old man asked. Absolutely. Puckerschwit beer goes through rigorous risk by testing to ensure every sip is pure bliss we got a team of highly trained taste testers myself included to which make sure that each batch makes our standards trust me you won't find beer like this anywhere else peter continued with the presentation, slowly showing the slide after slide while giving a brief explanations of how good puck sweat beer was to the company they really are after all they said it was done the free distributors sat up and clapped their hands together and they gave their positive feedback to both Peter and Preston. Peter took the row and thanked them. Patriot then walked up to Peter and congratulated him. I'm very proud of you, Peter. In fact, I'm giving you a major raise. Peter's eyes widened and he jumped for joy. Yeah, but not only that, I'm promoting you to assistant manager. Oh my god, thank you so much, Peter exclaimed. Of course, Peter said, and as another way to congratulate you, you may once again leave an hour early because of your initial end shift, if you'd like. 
And oh, there's an extra bonus for all your hard work. Preston finished handing Peter a hundred of a thousand and five hundred dollar check. Peter once again thanked Preston, and the two of them shook hands after they went their separate ways. Then the scene slowly transitioned to the time where Peter had to leave early. He clocked out for the day and headed back to the parking lot into his car. Peter drove down the car to the Quahog Mini Mart. He walked inside to greet Carl. Peter said he would like to buy loads of lottery tickets, to which Carl seemed to be okay with. Peter picked out a random numbers on each ticket, likely trying to win the lottery that he was about to take place later that night. Peter thanked Carl and headed back to his car. He then went to the local market and brought out a bouquet of roses along with a vase and water, a box of chocolates, and there was a shape of a heart. Finally, he made his way to the clam, to which he still had the broken glass window from Peter's incident. Peter parked his car and went inside. Cleveland and Joe were surprisingly in their, at their usual booth, with beer and mug in their hands. Peter then greeted them both. 